tell you a story about a woman named Elizabeth Key. In 1655, Elizabeth Key sued for her freedom in a Virginia court. Born to a white father and a slave mother, Key had become an indentured servant when she was five or six. Being an indentured servant meant that you owed your labor to a master for a set number of years. In Key's case, it was nine. At some point, and here the record is a little unclear, Key was transferred to a man named John Mottram. When Mottram died in 1655, Key was listed as part of his property, meaning she wasn't an indentured servant, but a slave. So, Key sued in court. She had three arguments as to why she couldn't be a slave. Her father was white, she had served her nine years, and she was a Christian. When the first court found in her favor, the ruling was appealed. It went to the legislature, called the House of Burgess, before going back to a lower court. Eventually, Key won her freedom and married her white lawyer, a man named William Greenstead. By 1667, the House of Burgess had made it significantly more difficult for a slave to sue on two of the three grounds that Key had used. In 1662, the House passed a law saying that the condition of slavery followed the mother. If your mother was a slave, you were too, regardless of the status of your father. And in 1667, with the support of the Anglican Church, the state-supported church in colonial Virginia, the House of Burgess ruled that baptism did not lead to freedom for slaves by birth. The story of Elizabeth Key in the House of Burgess in 17th century Virginia raises questions. How did it happen that some people came to be seen as most appropriately property, as slaves by birth? Why, in America, were those people with some African ancestry? And what was the role of Christianity in that development? Was it a force for freedom, as Elizabeth Key seemed to think? Or did it support human bondage, as the House of Burgess and the 17th century Anglican Church claimed? And what, if anything, does any of this have to do with us today? What difference does what happened in 17th century Virginia make? Hello, my name is Sarah Rubel. I'm a professor of American religious history and the creator of the series on the history of race and Christianity in the United States. I'm also a Christian. I've created this video series to explore the history, history of Christianity and race in America particularly the history of white and black people in the United States. My hope is that if we know more about this history, we, as Christians, will be better able to enter into the complex and fraught conversations, or sometimes shouting matches, we have in our country and in our churches around race. Any discussion about race in the United States involves a discussion about slavery. And that means trying to figure out something basic. How and what became the United States did slavery become identified with being black? I'm gonna use Virginia as one example to explore this question. Virginia was not the only place we can turn to for this story, but is an important place. Virginia was a large and influential colony what happened in Virginia directly affected a large number of Americans and indirectly influenced many others. The story of Virginia demonstrates that the identification of slavery with African ancestry was a complicated process. It involved existing slave systems in the Atlantic world, Christian evangelization, rebellion, and greed. When English ships landed in Virginia in the early 17th century, Europeans living in the Western Hemisphere already had an economic system that depended upon African slavery. Historians call this system the Atlantic system. Europeans had come to the Americas in search of easy money, gold really. They found a bit of that, but they soon realized that the real money was in more labor-intensive ventures, such as mass agriculture, sugar early on, and eventually things like tobacco. In 
and of course labor-intensive ventures need labor. There were not enough Europeans willing to do the labor, and European conquest, particularly in what we now call Latin America, had decimated the native population. Importing Africans to do the work was one way of supplying the labor. The route between Africa and America was one leg of the triangular Atlantic system. Europeans took slaves from Africa to the Americas, where the slaves would work, often quite literally to death, producing crops that Europeans would then take to Europe to sell. Proceeds and goods from those sales would then help buy more African slaves, who would be taken to the Americas, and so on. Now, it might seem like white Virginias just adopted the practice of importing Africans as, as slaves and that that fully explains how black people became identified as slaves and white people as free. But it was actually more complicated. In the early years of the colony, the situation in Virginia was not straightforward. Some Africans worked as indentured servants and were eventually freed. Some people of African descent had their own indentured servants and slaves. Native Americans, English, and Africans sometimes intermarried, or at least had children with each other. According to English common law, the child would take on the status of the father, therefore making it possible for, say, the child of a white father and a black mother slave or indentured, to be free. Over the course of the 17th century, the situation in Virginia and other colonies became much more straightforward and much worse for Africans and their descendants. In 1630, it wasn't clear that coming from Africa meant that someone was a slave in perpetuity. In the 1650s, it wasn't clear that having a slave mother meant you would be a slave. By 1705, laws had made what had been unclear quite clear. In that year, the House of Burgess passed the Act Concerning Servants and Slaves. The law clearly differentiated between white people a term first used in legal discourse in the last two decades of the 17th century, and people who were not white. So, for example, the law decreed that masters could not at any time whip a Christian white servant naked without an order from the justice of the peace. But non-white servants could be whipped naked. The act specified that white people and black people could not marry each other, even if they were both free. The act viewed black people and white people as different types of people, regardless of their economic status or religion. The 1705 Act also clarified that conversion did not free slaves. The Act twice states that people brought as slaves or born to slave mothers would be slaves even if they converted. The Act differentiated between people coming from a Christian country, meaning really somewhere in Europe, and people coming from a non-Christian country, here meaning any place in Africa. People coming from Europe could not be slaves, and people coming from Africa could be. Significantly, being born of Christian parentage also did not lead to freedom if your Christian mother was a slave. By 1705, what had once been a somewhat fluid system had become clearly delineated. There were people who were white, their ancestry was completely European, and they could not be slaves. There were people who were not white, what they called in the 17th and 18th centuries Negro or mulattoes, but we would term black. They were seen as most appropriately slaves. In fact, their slavery was a kind of genetic condition coming through the mother. Nothing, not even Christian conversion would change that. So again, why? 
Why make African descent, or being black, compatible with slavery, and European descent, or being white, incompatible with it? Well, money was one reason. In the last half of the 17th century, there was a shortage of labor coming from England. Years of civil war in England had depleted the population of young men able or willing to sell their labor across the Atlantic. And then the Great London Fire of 1666 provided a host of jobs in London. England would not, it became clear, provide a steady supply of cheap or free labor. But Africa could. And if you wanted a reliable, cheap labor force, making the people you imported slaves and not indentured servants made economic sense. You didn't lose slave labor after a term was up. If you declared that slavery was hereditary, following the mother, you might even develop a self-perpetuating labor force, as Virginia eventually did. There was then an economic motive for equating African descent with suitability for slavery. But that doesn't explain why you wouldn't also make it possible for people coming from Europe to be slaves. At first blush, it would seem to make more economic sense to make as many people as possible potential slaves. That's more labor after all. But wealthy white Virginians had a reason for wanting to separate the labor force into black people who could be slaves and white people who could be servants but never slaves. And that reason was rebellion. There were, in colonial Virginia, some very wealthy white planters. There were also a lot of poor white people. Rich white planters feared that poor white people and poor black people might make common cause against them. If poor people, regardless of race, viewed their similar economic status as more meaningful than their difference in skin color, they might band together against the much smaller number of wealthy Virginians. And that wasn't a hypothetical concern on the part of wealthy Virginians. Slaves and indentured servants sometimes ran away together and helped each other on the lamb. And more ominously, during Bacon's rebellion during the 1670s, a rather complicated rebellion led on both sides by elite white men, the last rebels to surrender were a group of black slaves and white indentured servants fighting together against the colonial authorities. For wealthy Virginians sitting atop a social hierarchy in which there were many more poor white people and slaves than wealthy planters, making certain that poor white people sided with wealthy white people was imperative. How do you do that? Well, you differentiate. You give poor white people, in the 17th century that meant poor white men, some political power, like the right to bear arms, and the right never to be slaves. The right, that is, not to be like those people who are black, who can be slaves. You give them an identity as white that trumps whatever shared economic concerns they might have with black people. As slavery became identified with skin color, Christianity played both a challenging and a supporting role. Some people, like Elizabeth Key, clearly thought that Christian conversion should lead to freedom. That belief, and the fact that it had some reasonable support, made many slave owners unwilling to evangelize slaves or allow missionaries to preach to them. They didn't want their slaves to convert if conversion led to freedom. They didn't even want to risk slaves having the belief that conversion might lead to freedom. The unwillingness of owners to evangelize frustrated the Church of England, the state-sponsored church in Virginia, which believed that preaching to slaves was part of its job. 
So the church was on board when in 1667, the House of Burgess declared that baptism did not end slavery. And in 1705, when the act concerning servants and slaves reinforced that law. The theological effects of declaring that baptism did not free slaves by birth, particularly when what made a slave a slave was race, were profound. First, it ground freedom not in religion, but in race. The English, since the 16th century, had held that Protestant Christianity was the source of their rights, including freedom. To be a Protestant Christian was to be free. By making Christian conversion irrelevant for freedom, the English settlers were saying that race, not faith, was the ground of freedom. Second, the combination of the law saying that slavery followed the mother and that baptism did not end slavery basically made slavery genetic and asserted that who your earthly mother was was more determinative of your status on earth than who your heavenly father was. On earth, race mattered more than conversion. In 1705, the law also tried to identify being Christian with being white. Watch how this language works. In one section, the act stipulates that no Negroes, mulattoes, or Indians, although Christians, or Jews, or Moors, Mahatmeans, or other infidels, shall at any time purchase any Christian servant, nor any other, except of their own complexion, or such as are declared slaves by this act. That's a mouthful, but here's the point. When the act says Christian servant, it means white servant. But it doesn't say white servant, it just says Christian. Everyone not white is Christian with a racial descriptor. Negro Christian, mulatto Christian, Indian Christian. Only white people are Christian without remainder. Although the language is convoluted, the point's clear. In Virginia, white people were more naturally Christian than non-white people, and the privileges associated with Christianity belonged to white people more than they did to anyone else. Not all Christians agreed. In 1723, a slave or a group of slaves sent a letter to the Bishop of London. How the letter got to the bishop is unknown, but we do know that for these slaves, the Christian message was one of freedom and kinship. The letter writers asked the bishop to free them, declaring, This we beg for Jesus Christ his sake, who commanded us to seek first the kingdom of God, and all things shall be added unto us. The petitioners also called out the inconsistency of Christian slaveholding, writing, Here it is to be noted that one brother is a slave to another, and one sister to another, which is quite out of the way, and as for me myself, I am my brother's slave. The petitioners noted that slavery made impossible important Christian practices, such as attendance at services, covenanted marriage, and consistent Christian education. We know that the Bishop of London did not end slavery in 1723. The letter, however, does suggest why some black Americans converted to Christianity, even though it was the religion of their enslavers. These black Christians saw in Christianity a message of freedom and of universal kinship of a community in which people from different places treated each other as beloved brothers and sisters, even if the people preaching to them refused to recognize it. By 1705 in Virginia, some things that had not been clear in 1625 or even 1655 were very clear. There were different classifications for different kinds of laborers, and those classifications were based on what we today call race. Black people were most properly slaves. White people could never be slaves. That's what it meant to be black or to be white.
other differences, class, gender, country of origin, were subsumed into the one overarching difference, black and white. What's more, race buried commonalities, even shared religion. Whether you were white or black was more determinative of your status than whether you were Christian or not. It's important to note that it didn't have to be this way. It was not inevitable that people coming from Africa had to be slaves. It wasn't inevitable that people coming from Europe couldn't become slaves. The identification of slavery with African descent came through a series of decisions made largely for economic reasons. It also wasn't inevitable that churches accepted or supported race-based slavery. As the letter to the Bishop of London shows, some Christians had a very different reading of the Gospel. The decision to throw the support of the church behind race-based slavery was exactly that, a decision. But, inevitable or not, the decision to identify economic conditions with certain skin colors and the decisions of many Christians to support that identification had profound consequences for the country and Christ's church.